Welcome back to our series of lectures from Mastering Trial Advocacy 2nd Edition. What we want to do now is have a conversation with you uh, and with one another, obviously, about one of the most important things that any trial lawyer does, case analysis. That product of sitting with the file and going through it and going through it and going through it until it is so ingrained that you feel like you're talking about it in your sleep. Case analysis is something that is rarely taught in law school because it is to a certain degree idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic to the individual who is performing it and the institution for which that individual works. Different uh, offices, for example, have different requirements of how they want cases properly analyzed before decisions are made. So, for example, in a prosecution's office, you may very well be required to write a prosecution memo that is provided to your supervisory attorney explaining what you want to charge, why you want to charge it, and what sort of facts support your charge, and potentially even the sentence that might result. That's an opportunity for the supervisory attorney to mentor the subordinate attorney, making certain that they understand and over time giving them more and more latitude. When I think about case analysis, I'm usually dealing with three different things. I'm dealing with the law, the facts, and my emotional response as a human being to the case that's before me. I know that I have to balance these three pieces of the equation because that's where my argument is going to come from in closing, and that's how I'm going to determine who I'm going to call as a witness and what I'm going to ask them. So I'm reading through it to identify those three structures. How might you proceed? Well, the first time, I just read whatever paperwork I've got, uh, and as soon as I'm done, I sit down and write down my response to it because I want to respond as a person, as a human being, to the thing that I've just read. I'm probably going to make some assumptions about good guys or bad guys. I'll have a picture in my head of what people do or do not look like, how I think they might sound. Now, that may or may not be verified later on, but it's there. We all do that. That's our own inherent implicit bias based upon the way we grew up, the environment that we were nurtured in, and the assumptions that we've learned to make in life to get by. I have to identify my implicit bias when I'm going through case analysis because that skews my vision of the case. How will I know it's my implicit bias? Well, I'll have somebody else on the team read the file. Do they respond the same way I did or did they come away with it with something entirely different? Then we begin to correlate those responses. I take that human look and I set it aside. And then I like to turn to the elements of the offense and the instructions that are probably going to be identified because that's where I find the law. And the law is how I begin to structure my legal argument. The beauty of the law, particularly as it relates to the instructions, is once I know what instructions I think the court is going to give, I can begin to structure a factual argument that plays into my strengths as far as those instructions are concerned. And if they don't, I start looking for case law to allow me to recommend a different set of instructions in that case. Let's talk about the beauty of using one of the systems that we recommend to you, the proof chart method, when we're talking about it. In this method, you have a column that contains an individualized row, all the elements that you need to prove in your case. And then in the remainder of that row, you're going to put in those facts, that evidence, those exhibits that are going to support those different propositions. The reason that is so valuable is that, number one, it allows you to get to see a bigger picture of the case and what's going forward with it. It also lets you add a, a column, in particular, for location within the file. So that when you're in trial and you need to impeach somebody, you can flip to that right away because that's how thoroughly you have prepared and gone forward with your case. Once you do that, I prefer that method because it allows me as a visual person to see what's going forward. I've seen different people use different methods. I've had people who have used mind maps. I've had people who have needed to just do straight witness lists and the facts that they're getting from individual witness. A recommendation to you. If you have not already, you should consider taking the Myers-Briggs personality test. Not because it reveals your future and your soulmate and where you're going to be in five years, but because it talks to you about how you choose to process and relate to different pieces of information. When you know that about yourself, you can build an organizational structure for case analysis that works for you. But here's the thing. The most important thing for case analysis isn't finding the magic method that everybody else uses. It what, it's what so much of trial work comes back to, which is you have to be genuine and true to yourself. 
The way that I advocate is different from the way that Dean Rose advocates. It's different from the way that any of our students advocate or our colleagues advocate. And that's a beautiful thing. That's part of what makes this system that we work in so valuable and valid. Because we have the ability to take into account those implicit biases and find a way to come around them. Because if I confront my own implicit biases and the implicit biases that exist among my team members, I can confront the ones that I'm going to encounter when I have those people sitting in the jury box. And I can call them out, shed the light of the law and the light of day on them, and help us to move forward as a people. Time spent in self-reflection uh, is useful time when identifying what works or does not work for you from a case analysis perspective. By nature, I'm an intuitive thinker. I find things that resonate with me and then I spin outward from that. Mind maps are very helpful for me. But I spent 20 years in the Army and what the Army taught me was the value of a checklist, the value of a process. And so I take that intuitive nature that I am most inclined to do and I connect it with an in-depth checklist with each element, each defense, and exactly where I've got the evidence that proves that. And then as I do this, I commit to the idea that this is an organic living process that changes over time. I accept that I'm going to discover facts that I didn't know and that some of the facts that I thought were going to be solid are not going to be solid because of some other reason. So I am continuously mining the case for analysis, searching for the perfect line, the perfect argument, the perfect moment so that I can key into the emotional reasoning of the jury. Because I know if I get their hearts, their minds will follow. To that end, one of the most important things that you can realize is that with this organic process, it is not enough to simply read through the file once, or twice, or three times. You should read through the file as often as you possibly can because as Dean Rose says, you're going to discover things that you left behind and you may discover that a fact that you have convinced yourself is in this is nowhere to be found. It's something that you have made an inference out of. Now that doesn't mean that you have to abandon it, but you must recognize it for the inference that it is and set up the dominoes, so to speak, in your closing to allow the jury to come to the same conclusion as well. Another advantage of detailed case analysis is it removes the specter of the intimidating objection because you've already identified. You know you're going to have a hearsay issue there, but you also know that under 8033 it's coming in all day long. Or you know that there's a character issue here, but here's the way that you're going to be able to use 404B to show that it's not character that you're using it for, it's motive, intent, plan or lack of absence or mistake that you're actually using that evidence for. By using the rules of evidence in conjunction with the facts as we do our case analysis, we incorporate the law and the facts to create a more superior product and to put us in a position of being the most persuasive, most authoritative person in the room that's going to carry justice out. Case analysis is your secret weapon when it comes to trial. At the end of the day, the person who best understands not only their case, but their opposing counsel's case and has identified the legal and factual arguments to counter is the person who is victorious, uh, depending upon, of course, how victory is defined based upon the case that you're dealing with. We can't change the facts, but we can apply, discover, and develop the law. And that's how change occurs from a societal perspective. And it all starts with a trial lawyer somewhere who had a fact pattern, who had a client, who had a problem, and they were trying to find a way to be their voice. We hope that this helps you be the voice for others. Please take care, and we'll see you down the road.